The recent fight against COVID was the largest deployment in the 223 year history of the United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. The pandemic highlighted many of the Corps' strengths, but its vulnerabilities as well. This is truly an unprecedented situation. What it's done is it's, it's put a mirror up to our public health system. It's allowed us to see the problems that exist at its roots. Uh, we literally have had to build public health systems from scratch in many communities to respond to COVID in order to be able to make testing available, in order to vaccinate people. These are things that should have been done a long time ago. Gene Migliaccio holds a doctorate in public health and he served as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Public Health Service. He's now the president of the Public Health Service Commissioned Officers Foundation. We, from becoming the unknown in public health, we became the known, mm -hmm. uh, and then we became the vilified uh, in, a, in a short order, in, in, in just a matter of, of a year plus time span. Um, and it was, it was really uh, rough to take with a lot of the misinformation. This is Conversations on Healthcare. Gene Migliaccio, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your invitation. Look yeah. forward to chatting with you today. I think many in our audience know about the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, or Margaret, maybe we haven't done our job, uh, but there's still a lot of confusion, even at the highest levels of government. The Commission Corps is the only uniformed service in the world dedicated to public health. Uh, perhaps you could start by uh, asking you to explain the core and what it does. Will do. I uh, appreciate it. That's a, that's a really a good question. We're going to talk uh, hopefully a little later on about the invisible core, but uh, we are a, a strong, mighty core of about 6,000 6, uh, individuals that uh, represent a, a, a number of different specialties. And, and I'll talk to you about it um, uh, as, we, as we go along today. But I, I wanted to uh, highlight some of the recent work that the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps has been doing to serve the nation. So we, we, our roots go back to 1798, where men and women have served on the front lines protecting the nation's public health uh, in what we know today as the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. We trace our origins way back to the U.S. Marine Hospital Service that, that was implemented to protect against the spread of, of diseases that were coming into the country, traditionally by seaport. Sailors who returned from foreign ports to maintain the health of, of new immigrants. So um, today uh, we are one of eight uniform services. Everyone knows about the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard. Um, they know about the Space Force and they may know about the National uh, uh, NOAA, National uh, Atmospheric Administration, uh, but not a lot of people know about the United States Public Health Service. So we're one of eight uniform services with a 200 year history. Uh, we're led by an Assistant Secretary for Health. Many people know the United States Surgeon General, um, and that's, those are our leaders. Uh, we have about 6,000 officers uh, that are full-time, highly qualified public health officers and specialists. And so I mentioned uh, we have a number of professions within the public health service. It includes physicians, dentists, nurses, pharmacists, uh, clinical um, uh, dietitians, engineers, health service officers, et cetera, that make up um, the, those 6,000 officers. We're deployed to many of the uh, uh, federal agencies throughout the Department of Health and Human Services. We also support 10 other federal departments with their health missions. Uh, and we're at actually 800 locations throughout the United States and the world. So, um, and just a little bit of a commercial on the core. Um, their sole mission is to protect, promote, and advance health and safety of the nation. And so they, they do that in a, in a variety of different missions. I'd be more than happy to chat with you more about that. Well, I want to thank you for that great overview. Uh, and I think particularly your, your last statement about their mission and purpose, really important message for the country. But I want to follow up by giving you an opportunity to explain the role of the group that you now lead, the Public Health Service Commissioned Officers Foundation. What's the mission and vision of this group? Well, the, uh, it, 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 it's an important mission. So the uh, foundation has, has was created about 24 years ago in, in, uh, 
And the sole purpose of the foundation is to provide support to, to those uh, commissioned officers of the public health service and build partnerships uh, between the, the commission core, the active duty core members and the larger public health community. Um, we focus on a, on a number of important areas, professional development. We run a symposium, an annual symposium for our officers uh, yearly. Uh, we focus on providing scholarships uh, to officers and their family members. Uh, we look at the preservation of uh, the history of, of the Corps, and we also focus on, on research and studies to advance public health uh, information and knowledge uh, to our broader audience of the, of the nation. Well, that's that's such important work. And and your nonprofit is part of a new documentary uh, titled Invisible Core, narr narrated by actress Ali McGraw. Uh, and the piece is trying to raise awareness about the core and also how the public health has become politicalized. Testing had a very slow start, as you know, in the United States. Uh, and I called all the experts from the Commission Corps many of whom were over at the Diamond Princes or in Wuhan, who had been testing everyone, brought in a bunch of logistics people, environmental health officer people, had some people from FEMA, and we basically camped out in my office for 48 hours to develop a national plan for drive-through testing. There were only 10 drive-through testing sites throughout the country. By the end of the weekend, we had a plan for 41 starting from scratch. And in those first 41 sites, which were implemented within 10 days, all around the country were all run by Commission Corps officers. Uh, I think we all live co through COVID. I think there was a good part of the early COVID where public health was thought of very positively. And we had many uh, guests on who were talking about this resurgence and, and young people thinking about attending uh, college and focusing in on, on public health. Uh, but uh, things changed along, along the path. But I'm wondering, uh, about things that might have changed. What was the impact to the core uh, that COVID brought about? Well, uh, your, your points are, are, are well spoken and well, well taken. Um, we, and I think about it, we have, first of all, we, from becoming the unknown in public health, we became the known, mm -hmm. uh, and then we became the vilified uh, in, a, in a short order, in, in, in just a matter of of a year plus time span, um, and it was it was really uh, rough to take with a lot of the misinformation uh, and uh, the um, pundits that talked about um, you know public health talked about uh, the response to to COVID uh, over over the years, and uh, I think it brought uh, tremendous uh, discredit to a lot of the work that uh, individuals do in public health in general across the United States, be they be they in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, or be they in in federal, state, or, or local health department. So it, uh, it, it there's been a little bit of a disservice um, based upon the the experience that we all went through d during COVID. Well, Gene, during the pandemic, I think you were probably one of the very first uh, units that was called up. The Public Health Service Commission Corps uh, deployed more than two of three of your 6,100 officers, which means people leaving their homes for who knows how long to go and serve, uh, mobilized them from across 11 professional public health and medical disciplines. Uh, certainly, we all remember the outbreak uh, on board the Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan. Uh, we remember the first uh, cases in the state of Washington, and your people were right there. So when you look back, as I think we all have on uh, the time of the COVID uh, pandemic and try and learn from it, what, what do you think the Corps did right during COVID? Where did you, uh, you look back and say, we really hit it? And where do you see opportunities? Should there be something like this? Hopefully there won't, but should there be something like this again, or just for the ongoing uh, focus of the core? Yeah, I, I, I think the, what we did right was uh, it was our mobilization, and just in terms of bringing the best minds together within the uh, uh, Commission Corps of the Public Health Service to start to think about um, uh, how we're going to uh, look at testing. When COVID hit, we didn't have testing centers, right? Um, and it started slowly, and then all of a sudden there were hundreds of them. But um, that took a tremendous amount of effort by some of the best and brightest minds um, within the Department of Health and Human Services. And our core officers were at the front lines uh, in terms of coming up with many of the of the plans. And then most importantly, in terms of the implementation and the deployment of, of resources. Um, so I think uh, what we did right was our immediate response 
to uh, bring together and conceptualizing the plan that we needed to implement to uh, combat COVID. And there was a lot of unknowns uh, along the way. And, and so various organizations, as we know, pivoted in terms of making d decisions that sometimes month, weeks and months down the, the, the lane, uh, we, we had new knowledge and we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, enhance our decision making and, and continue to course correct along the way from a quality perspective. I think that's critically important. Um, uh, some of our, our folks uh, within uh, the, uh, the, the, the world uh, and had, had decided to use that opportunity to basically state that uh, we didn't have a game plan. We, we were pivoting too quickly. Uh, but I think we had a lot of new information, a, new, a lot of new knowledge that was, was coming at us that we were actually deploying and implementing at the same time. Well, those were really difficult times. Uh, the Biden administration was uh, responsible for the vaccination process and they turned to the core, right? 2021 yep. uh, to be on the front lines. And people should remember this was dangerous work. Uh, and you really uh, helped lead the charge. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, Subsequent to that, are you now playing uh, any role in the upcoming fall vaccination efforts? But also maybe just reflect on uh, the, the time in 2021 and uh, the bravery that was shown by, by the Corps. Yeah. You know, I think of uh, uh, the time in 2021, our Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, Brett Jawar, and our, our U.S. Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, um, they were front and center uh, daily. Uh, in terms of some of the briefings that were given to the American people. Uh, they were at the front lines in terms of the deployment uh, and working with folks over at uh, CDC and uh, National Institutes of Health on vaccine uh, de development and starting that, uh, the initial thought process. Dr. Tony Fauci was front and center, um, also a, a prior core member. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the efforts that took place in 21 were able to actually help us as we started to uh, develop a vaccine and then move forward with a vaccine uh, d deployment plan thro throughout the nation. Uh, and uh, tremendous partners that were that were actually brought in to, to work with the, uh, the federal government from the private sector uh, to actually work on the deployment of, of that vaccine. And so that's a lesson learned um, in terms of future pandemics, in terms of that playbook, in terms of what we need to do, in terms of um, taking, uh, work, working with our, our scientists, our public health scientists, and working with our community partners uh, for uh, rapid deployment of, of vaccines. And, uh, and that's a, a, an outtake in terms of what we've learned. What we also learned, and I, and I just want to share with you, we learned that our, our public health infrastructure, it's been well stated and well said in, in, in our environment, in the public health environment. But for your audience, I just want to certainly tell you that we still have uh, 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 fractures throughout the public health system. And there was a recent study that was put out by the Dumont Foundation. And what we see in, in here is that today, we still have about 80,000 uh, full-time equivalents that were short in public health. And that's at the local health departments and state health departments. We're 50,000 short at local health departments for professionals in public health and 30,000 at the state health departments. And what I thought we, what we would see is, is more an outpouring of, of more federal resources for um, uh, training of, of uh, individuals coming into the health professions for scholarships and, and to bring more and more individuals into the world of public health. Um, it has it, it materialized for a short period of time, and now we're on to something different. So that, that's a concern, you know, in terms of where we are today in 2024, uh, just a short time uh, past the pandemic. But the, the infrastructure needs a tremendous attention, and I'm concerned that um, we're not there and it's going to take some time to, to get there. So we're going to see another pandemic sometime, hopefully not in our lifetimes, but there, there will be more. And so what we've learned uh, in terms of the, the fractures in our, in our public health infrastructure, community level, state level, and even federal level, where we need to put more resources. And I'd like to see more emphasis being placed in that space. 
Well, that sounds like a, a good strategy, Jean. Uh, and anybody who's involved in health and health care, particularly public health, maybe has to be a little bit thick skinned about what gets thrown at you in terms of critiques, because you wouldn't be out there in front and they wouldn't be talking about you if you weren't doing very difficult uh, work. Yeah. But still, there is this uh, need to educate the public inspire the next generation of people uh, and build those partnerships across the country. And I would imagine when you're in the commissioned core, one has certain limits around, you know, how, how much one communicates and how one communicates. But with your foundation, I'm, I'm wondering how much of an effort are you making to fundamentally uh, get that message out there about the work of the Corps, about the opportunity for young people, no different than Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, uh, other opportuni opportunities for service that people have had. What are, you, what are you doing to get the attention of young people to be on the campuses and in the schools and in the communities? Yeah. You know, one of the things that we did and, and um the, the, the foundation um, can be that voice for officers that are part of a, a established um, uh, governmental organizations. Uh, so as a foundation, we can use our voice um, to actually articulate some of the areas where we can continue to strengthen the core and also strengthen the health and the public health infrastructure of the nation. So one of the things that we came up with, and just in terms of bringing the voice forward, was a, a documentary on the Invisible Core. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it kind of traces the, the roots of, of the Commission Corps going back to, to our earliest days of 1798. But it's really a story about public health in the United States in terms of how we've developed as a nation over the past 200 years, with the Commission Corps being an integral part of, of that um, that history of uh, of development from from all from diseases coming in through the seaports in terms of coming up with strong um, public health um, systems and programs throughout the country, uh, the, the core really has a has an important role. So we one of the thoughts that we we came up with is is in terms of just trying to get more attention brought to public health, and we put forward a, a documentary uh, called the Invisible Core. The term invisible is because many times. You don't know about public health. It's silent. You know, if you're drinking water from your faucet or, for, uh, or if you buy bottled water, it comes out pure. You don't have to worry about it. If uh, if there's no air pollution in your community and the climate is great, uh, you don't think about it. It's when things start to break uh, that you start to realize about uh, the, uh, the the really the, the the individuals that support the public's health with some of the systems that they uh, that they're engaged with. So. I, I think that uh, um, the, what the foundation has done uh, is, is brought a, a, a renewed awareness to uh, public health in general with our documentary, not only to talk about the core, but to talk about public health in general. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also um, put forward uh, in terms of developing, we, every year we, we educate uh, and provide a symposium where we focus on public health leadership for our officers. And the important thing in terms of education is, to, is really to strengthen not only our officers, but the work that they do on a daily basis so they can have a major impact on the health of, uh, of uh, Americans throughout the, the nation. Dean, you know, I want to pick up a thread of, of what we were talking a little about, about earlier, because foundations got a number of, of uh, opportunities to be the voice and vehicle for, for combating some very difficult problems. And one is this con uh, contagion of anti-science has become one of the greatest threats to the health of our communities. I'm wondering how you're going about that do you have the right resources in place to do that? Uh, tell us a little more about this effort. It's so important because we've seen, as you, we talked about earlier, the early part of COVID, uh, everybody was looking to the science and then all of a sudden there became a backlash uh, and you've got a lot of false narratives going on. Yeah, I, I, I wish uh, we had more resources to combat some of the misinformation out there. I think it's gonna take uh, quite a bit of time um, bef before we, we can finally look on the, on the other side because um, individuals are, are, no matter where, what we look at um, uh, within the United States, just focusing on the states, um, you're gonna have individuals that, um, that really look to government for solutions and you're gonna look, you have individuals that look away from government for those solutions that are coming at you. Um, I think in the area of public health, we, were, we haven't been questioned like this uh, for 
perhaps our history. Uh, but but now uh, there has been a, a vocal um, uh, push to question the science, to question the delivery, to question decisions that are made by public health leaders. So I think we have a tremendous amount of work to do. We have a tremendous amount of work to do with our elected officials to, to get the resources that we need to really start to, to try and put some uh, solid information out there and combat the misinformation. So that's that's critically uh, in, important. So to, to, to continue to tell the story about individuals uh, like the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service that does good uh, as that only uniform service in the United States that really does good throughout the world, uh, we're the only uniform service you had mentioned that. Um, but, you know, when you think about our work in terms of touching Americans every day from that fluoridated uh, drinking water to eliminating malaria in the country to caring for veterans um, and, and and focusing in on on some of the major disasters that we've seen from the 9-11 attacks, the Hurricane Katrina's to Ebola outbreaks in Liberia to COVID as we, as we discussed, to other uh, uh, plagues of opioids, gun violence, uh, industrial accidents that we see, and so many, many more things. Um, if, we, if we're doing those things right, uh, mm -hmm. we will start to rebuild that trust that, um, that's been challenged uh, through through COVID in terms of some of the politics, the politicization that we've gone through. But it, when we start to do things right, um, we'll, we'll start to regain that trust. Uh, I really believe that. Um, we had another major deployment uh, a number of months back with the Commission Corps with the fires out in, in Maui and in Hawaii. Mm, uh, we've been at many of the, uh, any of the major shootings that take place within the United States, although unfortunate, the Corps is always there working on behavioral health. And, and so we're continuing to deploy, we're continuing to do good. And I think that that will tremend tremendously help rebuild those, that trust within community by community by community along the way. Well, telling the story uh, as you are doing is so important uh, to building support. Uh, but we all know the pragmatic reality that funding is critical to the strategy of how you actually take those resources and get out there. Uh, I, I was surprised to learn uh, that I think you don't have a specific line item in the federal budget for service operations, but this is something that you're advocating for. Tell us about that. Do you have the challenges of going to Congress every year looking for support for the Corps, or is that built into the federal budget already? Yeah, the, the, the foundation doesn't have that uh, as, as, a, uh, as a foundation. Uh, we, uh, we, we leave that to our association, the Commission Officers Association does a lot of the lobby work in terms of trying to get resources for the Commission Corps. Um, and, and I know that uh, uh, the agencies do too. Uh, the, the department really pushes hard, but it, 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 we're strained. Uh, we're underfunded, uh, underfunded uh, and under-resourced. Our Commission Corps, unfortunately, is not as strong as it used to be. We're down in, in, in numbers. We used to be uh, approximately around 6,400, and now we're less than 6,000. So we lost many officers after COVID. Uh, and uh, there's been a, an issue in terms of uh, trying to onboard more officers in, into the Corps. So that's a challenge for us, too. So um, we're, we're feeling the effects. Uh -huh. And Gene, if you look at that pipeline, I'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of uh, young people's interest in public health careers. We talked about this a little earlier, that early on phase of the COVID, there was an enormous amount of interest. What's public health? And people finally got what public health was, then there was a drop off. But right now, uh, what are you hearing or seeing uh, across the country in terms of young people wanting this as a profession? Yeah, thanks. That's an excellent question. It kind of hits at my day job in terms of uh, my work uh, as as an associate dean over at the uh, School of Public Health, Millican Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. So uh, after COVID, uh, we're the largest school of public health in the United States in terms of student size because we have a massive um, uh, online presence. Our enrollment was through the ceiling. It was just amazing right after COVID. There was so many, so much interest in, in uh, public health, a lot of people interested in epidemiology, for example. Um, but then over the last few years, probably around uh, two and a half, three years, we're starting to see that height start to decline back to where it's been typically. Now, 
We belong to uh, the, the university, as many schools of public health belong to the associated schools and programs of public health. Um, and the, the numbers across the board from all schools of public health is down from our height from, from a few years ago. Um, I think there was this, gro this groundswell. I think we got some great uh, students that have come into public health. And I think it's going to be wonderful as we start to graduate uh, 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 our students uh, into the workforce. And hopefully it can take many of the jobs where there's uh, openings and vacancies and, and, uh, and as we call it, um, governmental public health and federal, state, local health departments. Um, I, I believe that uh, that'll, that'll be a wonderful uh, benefit for, for our communities in terms of minting brand new uh, individuals that have our public health trained. So um, I'm, I'm excited about, about that. We're starting to see, you know, uh, more and more uh, physicians and nurses and pharmacists. There was a large groundswell across all health professions, not only the field of, of public health. All right. Well, maybe uh, I could get you to speak to just one more uh, specific area before we begin to wrap up. Um, but certainly we have had uh, many wonderful colleagues who were former members of the Indian Health Service. And I understand that's actually the most common agency for commission officers to serve in. Uh, the IHS and the Corps have just developed a seven-year strategic plan to really improve this recruitment and retention of public health service officers with expertise in health, but also engineering and environmental health. What are the specific challenges of recruiting officers to work with the Indian Health Service, uh, and how is that work progressing? Are you making inroads with that, and perhaps are you able to recruit from within the Native population as well? Yeah, that, that, that's the key. Um, you know, uh, recruiting from the native population is, is ideal. They, they really have a, it, people, you know, identify from within their communities so that right. we do see a lot of individuals uh, from uh, Native Americans that are actually um, entering the health professions and actually going back to their communities to really to make a difference. And, I, and that's wonderful. Um, one of the, I think one of the most difficult things that you find in recruitment, uh, not only within the Indian Health Service, but just in terms of rural America uh, and a lot of our, uh, our, our reservations or our uh, not in urban areas where you typically are, are able to attract a broad uh, a group of health professionals, but uh, they're in, in rural areas. And it's really difficult across the board. Um, and, and, and Native Americans, um, they have some really unique um, health issues that are so critical to, to, to bring professionals in from uh, not only in terms of the clinical specialties, but basically uh, in the area of, of behavioral health, um, in the areas of, of nutrition, um, et cetera. So it, it's, it's, um, it, it's really important that the Indian Health Service is actually on a, on a recruitment drive because uh, there are health professionals that really want to, uh, to number one, support uh, Native Americans, number two, special populations, and number three, um, they really want to come into the United States Public Health Service as a commissioned officer to, to do good. And, uh, and the Indian Health Service is a wonderful organization, uh, welcoming organization that um, will take care of officers throughout their careers if they stay with the Indian Health Service. They've got wonderful facilities um, throughout the United States. And, Gene, and their medical centers are, are second to none. Gene, think, uh, thinking about uh, doing good, I'm wondering if you could tell our audience about your service. We understand one of the key moments was coordinating the federal health care response to over 200,000 Katrina evacuees in Houston. Uh, yeah. Tell us some more. Oh, thanks. Uh, that, that, I got to go back in the memory bank, but it's uh, that's a wonderful question. It was one of my highlights of of uh, being a public health officer um, to to support a mission. Uh, so when Hurricane uh, Katrina came came roaring through uh, uh, New Orleans, a lot of individuals took shelter in the Alamo Dome. Um, and so the, the thought process uh, back uh, in the day was there would be a dome to dome transfer with uh, some of the, the issues that were taking place in New Orleans with uh, the Superdome uh, infrastructure being depleted. Uh, uh, it went through a hurricane. It had uh, holes in the ceiling. It, uh, uh, it wasn't a really a safe place to house so many individuals. So uh, there was a, a plan afoot a was to move. Uh, it was a dome to dome transfer, Superdome to Alamo Dome in Houston, Texas. Um, and they brought buses in to, to, uh, to move people out. 
Uh, and when that mission was over, uh, not only those 16,000 people came, but about 200,000 people migrated to Houston, Texas from wow. New Orleans and put a <laughs> tremendous strain on the community. Um, and we saw that uh, out migration from New Orleans in many different areas. In Texas, there was, you know, we, we saw it not only in Houston, but we saw it in Dallas and San Antonio, and, and we saw it in Mississippi, um, and we, we saw it in other places. So public health officers were deployed to various um, cities to uh, work with the, uh, with, with the infrastructure. So in my particular case, uh, I was assigned to the mayor's office in Houston, Texas, uh, to be the, at the time, uh, the secretary's representative for the federal response for um, the city uh, of, of Houston. Um, and I immediately uh, engaged actually with a colleague of mine that I had known from my uh, uniform service days, who was actually leading uh, the charge for Houston uh, and we were colleagues and uh, he was running the, uh, the public health hospital system uh, in Houston and I was able to connect with him to find out their needs. I also worked with uh, the uh, Houston Department of Health to just find out what the needs were. Their resources were totally strapped with over 200,000 people coming in. Their uh, convention, their Superdome was full, their convention center was full. Uh, they were placing individuals and in, uh, uh, in a lot of temporary shelters. And uh, so our response was uh, to mobilize um, medical assets outside of Houston because uh, they had their population to take care of. So we actually worked um, for our Houston case, we actually worked with wonderful organizations in California, uh, Scripps Health and uh, Kaiser, uh, who sent in um, hundreds of, of medical professionals, uh, physicians and nurses and, um, and, and behavioral health uh, specialists. And we were able to federalize them and they were able to um, not only help out at areas like the Alamo Dome, or, uh, but they were also able to help out in the convention center and okay. also provide resources throughout the city. So it was a wonderful experience in terms of the collaboration that we received from our, our, our federalization and mobilization of uh, private sector. Uh, but in terms of working with uh, the city of Houston at the time, the mayor and, and, and uh, uh, his uh, uh, senior health staff, uh, it, it was phenomenal. Every day they met uh, talking about uh, a, a number of things, housing, but medical and health, public health was front and center. Uh, so it was a, it was a great experience in terms of the work that you that we that we did. Uh, I spent about 60 days uh, mm -hmm. in the city uh, providing uh, uh, so support, whatever the city needed. My job, the secretary told me was whatever the city needs from a public health response. Let's make it happen. And that's your, your orders, and then you can figure out how you're going to do it. Well, Gene Migliaccio, thank you so much for your time, for your insights, and for your service. And thanks to our audience for being here. Be sure to subscribe to our videos on YouTube. Find us on Facebook and X with our account name, CHC Radio. And as always, you can go online to chcradio.com and sign up for email updates. And please share your thoughts and comments about this program. Gene, thank you so much for joining us here today on Conversations on Healthcare. Yeah, my, my pleasure. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Conversations on Healthcare or its affiliated entities.